She is the current civic engagement coordinator at the American Indian Center of Houston. Uh, Allie is originally from Minnesota, living parts of her life in Kentucky and Texas. She obtained her BA in anthropology with two minors in ancient civilizations and history. Allie is currently working on her master's thesis focusing on women in the wool industry. She has a background in curation, museum education, and cultural heritage. She has worked previously with the Miles Lax Band of Ojibwe in Minnesota. She currently lives in Houston with her husband, one dog, and three cats. Tonight, she will be talking about the current culture, past and present. So please join me in welcoming Allie to this uh, wonderful uh, event tonight. Go ahead, Allie. Thank you. Hi guys, it's so wonderful to meet you all. I'm so glad you guys are all here. I was not expecting like almost 200 of you, but super fantastic. Uh, so as Muhammad was saying, I'm the Civic Engagement Coordinator over at the American Indian Center of Houston. We've partnered up with you guys. Um, so I'll give a presentation kind of talking about Karankawa history and culture, um, and they'll hopefully be about 15 or 20 minutes or so. And then um, they would also like me to share with you guys some kind of do's and don'ts about working or interacting with people of indigenous cultures and backgrounds, just kind of to be aware. Um, kind of going ahead, I am not an indigenous person. I'm just a person who's very passionate about preserving history and culture. Um, I'm not affiliated with any tribe. Um, so some things I know just from doing my own research, but I would never presume I am one. Um, so just kind of labeling that background just to make that clear. So these are just some of the things I'm gonna be talking about tonight. Um, there's a really vast history about Kronkwa culture and it really kind of stems down to like a 300 year period. So I'll kind of go briefly over the indigenous cultures here in Texas. Um, I'll talk a little bit about geography, um, sharing space in Southeast Texas, some cultural history um, about their culture and community, lifestyle and language, um, cultural myths that are being taught in our schools today. Um, European discovery, I put discovery in quotations, and conflict um, about Spanish and French missions and the war. Um, pirates and then Stephen F. Austin's colony, the Texas Revolution, um, end of the Karankwa culture, and then the renewal of the Karankwa culture. So there's a lot going on um, I'll talk about tonight. So I am a huge fan of maps. Um, this is probably one of my favorite maps. This is an ethno-linguistic map of Texas in 1500 and 1776. So as everyone's kind of aware, we are all down this Houston area in the purple. And these are just some of the different tribes and the language groups that are all kind of in Texas, 1500, like I mentioned, and then in 1776. Um, Texas has a really vast indigenous culture, but not a whole lot was documented um, via language or anything up until um, the Spanish came in the 1520s. Um, but all this discovered today is through the archaeological record that we can find um, all across Texas, which is really fascinating. So um, the Houston area between the 1500s and the late 1800s, there were a lot of different groups going on. So the Karankawa is kind of like an umbrella term for different family groups, which I'll talk about here in a minute, but we did have the Badai in the area. We had the Tankawa, we had the Cato coming down here. The Comanche were down here at some point. You have other groups like the um, Atacapa and the Coheltacan. Um, and these are all groups that are gonna be living primarily from the Houston area, going all the way down um, past Matagorda, down to the Corpus Christi area. And this is kind of the main space of the Krunkwa residing called home. Um, as I mentioned, these groups, because there are so many, it's kind of hard to differ, um, differentiate between who is who. So yes, you have the umbrella word of Krunkwa or of Tankawa, but the way these groups are kind of separated, which I'll go over here in a minute, um, they were all had different bands and individual family groups. So they all had different names. So that's why you get four or five variations of the word Tankawa or Karankawa. Um, so you have all these different spelling variations because they all are kind of different family groups. So all kind of fall under the umbrella term of kind of this culture. Um, not much is known, like I mentioned about indigenous prehistory here in Texas, just because, you know, there was no written record at that time. Um, a lot of it is archaeological. What's really kind of fascinating is that we kind of have the first kind of earliest Karankawa connection 
there was a um, female human skeleton that was found in um, Freeport a few years ago, and she is um, being linked to the Karankwa people. So she's one of the earliest Karankwa tribes members that we have in the archaeological record, which is really fascinating. And if you want to learn more about her, you can find out more if you um, Google about her skeleton in Freeport. So the name uh, Karankawa means dog lover or dog raiser. It was actually really fascinating that they were actually known to domesticate foxes um, or coyotes, kind of a mix between the two. You can actually still find these animals today. You can only find them down in Galveston on the island. Um, I've never seen one myself, but you apparently can see a couple um, different of the animals down at the state park, which is really cool. So these animals are still around today um, due to the Karankawa, which is really fascinating. The Karankawa were semi-nomadic, so that means that they are going to be traveling along with foods, um, with the food and on um, seasons. They um, mainly traveled between the mainland here in the Houston, between Matagora Bay and Corpus Christi, like I mentioned, but they're also going to be going um, to all those different islands like Galveston, Matagora, Mustang Island, and so on. Um, they mainly stuck with the two seasons that we have here in Texas, you know, the really short two months of winter and then the rest being summer. So in the warmer months, they were mainly on the island, surviving off of seafood stuff. So crabs, fish, sharks, um, sea turtles, and so on. Uh, and in the colder months, they'd be going into the mainland, so mainly hunting animals like game, um, sorry, um, like deer, like rabbits, bison, which we used to run in this area as well. Um, because they were nomadic, their homes had to be built um, in rapid succession and also um, with lightweight materials because these homes were only temporarily used because they were constantly moving around. Um, so these homes are very similar, similar to wigwams, um, which are typically made of a light reed material. These are called box in the Karankawa language. And these are made of lightweight willow poles and rushes. Um, they will occasionally use um, animal skins um, kind of as provider for the door to help keep the wind out in the um, winter months, as we know, it gets very, very windy. Um, but they'll be either traveling um, through dugout canoes um, or by sled um, through the coyote dogs that they've um, domesticated as well as walking. Um, so they primarily stayed in family groups during most of the year. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of different these subfamily groups. Um, the Karankawa are believed to be matrilineal matrilocal. So that means that they stay within the wife's family, not the husband's. So it's typically mom and dad, grandma, grandpa. Um, and then the children that are all kind of living in this area, occasionally the sisters will stay as well. So there's about eight to 10 people per family group. So that's a pretty sized group altogether. Um, so they're pretty much, um, solid, you know, they're solitary more in the warmer months because they can have an ample amount of food they can provide for themselves. But in the cooler months, the groups will all kind of come together and form kind of a larger community where um, they can preserve their food, they can get larger hunting parties out and so on. And that way they have easier ways of um, providing for each other. Um, I'm not gonna go through this full list here, but I have the different clans that's listed in that bullet point there. Like I said, those are just some of the different pronunciations and versions of the word Karankawa that you'll find. And all of these are taken from Spanish and French missions around the Houston area. So there's all of these different groups and we get some of these names from, um, Cabeza de Vaca, which I'll talk about here in a bit, as well as on um, Jean-Baptiste Toulon. Um, so you have these different family group variations. Um, the, for the lifestyle and language, they were described um, in the 1500s as being very tall and muscular, often not wearing clothing. I wouldn't either. It's very hot in this region, so it makes sense. Um, so they typically be wearing things like breechcloths, um, covering their genitals, doing the heat. Um, women often wore clothing made from Spanish moss. It's nice and lightweight. Um, and then using um, animal hides to, uh, to make clothing in the cooler months, um, which is really fascinating. They did perform scarification. So that's um, things like tattooing, piercings, the, um, using um, sugarcane. And they actually would do like their nose. They would do their chest area, their nipples and lips. Um, is undetermined if they were more of a um, sexually dimorphic thing, if men were doing or women or both, but still really fascinating that scarification was attributed to the culture. Um, they were documented in the 1500s as being very skillful and fast runners and travel land by foot, like I mentioned. Um, is how they're mainly gonna be getting around. They're gonna be pulled by the sleds, by the dogs that they would domesticate. Um, and that carried the majority of their longings, though they don't have a whole lot, like I said, because they are nomadic. 
Um, there was a spoken language at a time. However, today only 100 words or even less now is um, preserved um, from a document that was found in the 1890s um, by a person who interacted with the Karankawa. Um, so we don't know a whole lot about their language, but we do know that they also use smoke signals to convey messages to other groups that they were far away using different colored smoke and everything else to commit um, to talk about things like war, marriage, gatherings, and so on. There are a lot of cultural myths about the Krunkwa, and a lot of these are taught in schools today. If you go up to any fourth grader and you're like, hey, what's the thing about the Krunkwa? They're instantly going to say they're cannibals, they were giants, or they were aggressive. And see, there, these are things that I really yeah. wish I could take away from the Texas Peaks and take out of our educational system. These are just myths that were brought upon by the colonizers. So kind of going through, um, through these, um, the first is that they were cannibals. Um, a lot of indigenous cultures are not cannibal by the sense, but they're just going to take a bite out of somebody's arm. Often they're going to partake in acts of cannibalism by um, consuming the ashes of a person who either died of mysterious circumstances, was murdered, or so on, um, to bring on visions to determine how that person passed away. Sometimes um, a warrior will take a chunk of flesh from uh, his opponent and eat it to kind of absorb that kind of energy that that person had. So you do get some acts of cannibalism, but it's it's in a very different manner than they were just, I'm hungry, I'm going to eat this person. Um, the one small rumor that they were cannibals is actually started from Cabeza de Vaca in the 1500s, which I'll talk about here in a bit. Um, he was actually the one who spread the rumor because it was actually the Spanish that were eating each other because they ran out of food from their shipwreck. So it was actually a white myth that they created because they were doing it themselves, which is kind of fascinating. Um, another one of the big myths is that they were giants. The human body is really fascinating and depending on where you live, your body is going to can be completely different here in the United States to Europe, to Africa, to Asia, and so on. Um, all of our food today is fattier, it's genetically modified and all that stuff, so our body structure is going to change. Um, on average, men in Europe, you know, between the 16 1700s are about five feet tall. Um, women were even shorter than that, obviously, but you have here in the United States or in countries like Africa and so on, where you don't have heavy genetically modified objects yet, you know, you aren't, you know, um, uh, mutating genes yet in plants and foodstuffs, so your body structure is going to be very different. So in Europe, because they're already doing that, they're a lot shorter, but here, because they're eating kind of more natural, I would say kind of more foods, not so much modified yet, um, their body structure is very different. So they're very lean, they're very tall, while as people in Europe are gonna be a lot shorter. Um, so everyone picks on Napoleon for being um, very short, but hey, that was actually really average for men to be about five feet. So that's kind of where you get the myth of them being giants was kind of the body structure. Um, they were aggressive, it's another one of the big myths. A lot of indigenous cultures around this time were aggressive. Um, they had people coming into their area, the um, colonizers from Europe or other places around the United States were coming in and they were taking their land. You have other tribes coming in like the Comanche or the Apache who are also other aggressive um, groups, again, due to issues, like I mentioned before, that are coming in taking away foodstuffs. You have food constantly being scarce and so on due to um, hunting and everything else. So there's a lot going on. It kind of makes sense that you're a little angry that you can be aggressive because you're fighting for your home. So it makes sense. Um, so that seems very alien to Christianized people um, compared to what the Karankawa. Um, so it, there's just so much kind of going on. So compared to the peace-loving colonizers in the area, you have the aggressive Karankawa. The first written record of the Karankawa people was in 1528, like I mentioned, by Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca. Um, he was part of a Spanish expedition that um, failed that would shipwreck on Galveston Island. Um, like I mentioned, the rumor about them being cannibals actually came from his group because once they shipwrecked, they were, didn't have food, they weren't able to provide hunt for themselves, so they actually began eating each other. Um, Cabeza de Vaca and um, two other crew members would live among the Karankua for about six or seven years, and he would actually write an ethnography um, about the culture, so that's where we get some of the earliest records. Um, after that, there was kind of a hundred year gap or so, maybe not quite a hundred years, maybe 70 or so years between um, Devaca and then the, when the Europeans would come back into the area. And that was the famed French expedition La Salle, if everyone's aware of that hitting at Matagorda Bay. Um, and they would establish a fort near there, which was Karankawa territory. 
Um, there were a lot of skirmishes and issues going against the groups, um, trying to get rid of each other violently. Um, you get the um, story of the Talon family, which came from the Matagorda region from um, LaSalle, one of the families that came. Their children were taken by the Karankwa people and lived there for about three to four years. After returning back to France, um, they would give a very detailed, almost an ethnography themselves about the Karankwa people. And these records were actually just rediscovered back in the 1970s. So we have a lot more information about it that's currently being translated. Um, the Spanish and French would come more into the area when you get into the 1700s and they'd be building, um, building colonies, missions, and forts um, out the wazoo in the Matagorda Bay kind of Galveston region. And their goals were to civilize and Christianize, which we are kind of all aware of um, the Krunkwa people as well as all their native tribes here in the area. Um, this lasted for almost 100 years. Um, missions were constantly being burnt down and rebuilt over time because um, they're trying to make them as trade hubs. And so with, you know, all these different um, indigenous groups kind of coming into play, there were a lot of different conflict going on. Um, by 1779, the Caronqua Spanish War would officially start. And the Spanish, who obviously had access to firearms and other um, European um, materials, were a far, you know, worse enemy than the, the Kronkwa, and so it was easily an opportunity to take away the Kronkwa land because of the weapons and everything else they had. That year, uh, sorry, that war would last roughly about 12 years or so. Um, many atrocities and horrific things were done to the Kronkwa people. Um, but by the end of the war, due to their resiliency, the Kronkwa were still around and maintained their land. Jumping a little bit more into the future, you bring in pirates. So in Galveston in, 18, um, in 1819, as some of you know, um, Galveston Island was actually a pirate colony by Jean Lafitte. Um, and he would be one of the huge major factors of um, the indigenous removal of the island. Um, he would set up kind of a peace treaty between the two and acts of trade, but no one complained nicely, especially them being pirates. Um, so constant skirmishes were a huge issue between the Karankua and Lafitte. Um, causing heavy losses. And so choosing kind of the safer route, the Kronk would decide to leave the island. Um, just a few years later, that's when you get the arrival of Stephen F. Austin's um, old 300 colony. So the um, arrival of 300 families to take up thousands of acres in the Houston, um, Southeast Texas region um, where their families could settle. And that would be another devastating hit to the Kronk people. The Texas Revolution then starts about 10 years later in the 1940s. So during this time between Mexican and Texas and the Texas Republic, um, both groups considered the Karankwa's enemies. Mexican Texas epically failed with trying to colonize them and Christianize them. They wouldn't willingly give up their land. The Texas Republic, the people who were coming into the area with Stephen of Austin, you know, they had to fight the indigenous groups here for their land so they can make their home. So they were just considered a mutual enemy. So there were no direct battles or wars between the two, but whenever either the Mexican Texans or the Texas Republican, um, Republicans came into contact with a Kronkwa family group, um, there were skirmishes or battles and they're unfortunately annihilated. Um, with Texas winning the war, you get the proclamation of Indian annihilation. And so that is the um, expedite extermination of indigenous peoples that are in the area um, by Stephen F. Austin's party. Um, Post-revolution, this is where the Karankwa really kind of faced, this is kind of the last straw for them. Um, Texans often referred, um, refused to offer them assistance. Again, they were on their land. They weren't willing to move. So you're not going to want to work with those people who are going to want to chase them away or, you know, threaten their lives if they don't leave. Um, they would try to flee to Mexico, but of course, with them already being involved with the um, Mexican Texans, they were kicked out of Mexico because they were also considered, you know, unchristianized, uncivilized, and so on. So they want nothing to do with them. There were attempts um, of integration with other tribes, such as the Apache and the Jamano, as they migrated west. Um, as I mentioned, you know, they would flee to Mexico, but due to the myths that were pronounced about them, about being cannibals and being aggressive and being, you know, fierce, um, they were pushed off the border. And so they did find a small settlement that they um, peacefully lived for a few years up until 1958, when the very last um, written record about the Kronko would take place. And that was a battle that was um, led by Juan Cortina. 
and that he was the official extinction of one of the last Karunkwa groups, and after that, they were considered extinct. Now, jumping a few hundred years into the future, there is a positive side to all this. Despite the mass extinction that they faced, despite the loss of language, culture, and land, the Karunkwa is actually making a comeback. The group today is now called the Karunkwa Kadla, and these are the um, supposed descendants of the Karunkwa people. So the ones who were able to make it out, the ones who were able to integrate with other cultures and tribes, who were able to preserve some of that language through um, boarding schools and all that stuff. So they're very, very resilient people, and they were still able to be around today. Um, they are mainly seen today in Corpus Christi. That's where one of the um, one of the groups lives, and then the other one is in Galveston. Um, that's the two different clans that we have here in Texas. Um, it is unknown to me if they want to become an official registered tribe or if they just kind of want to be more of a cultural known group like some of the other ones that we have throughout Texas. One of the big things that they're doing right now is that there is a um, chemical pipeline that is being built down in Corpus Christi by the Enbridge um, company. And so right now they are um, fighting that because where it's being built is being built on an ancient um, archaeological site that belonged to the Karunkwa people. So they were actively fighting to protect their old homeland, actively trying to preserve and relearn their lost language and relearning their culture. So they're doing a lot of very wonderful things. You guys can find them on Facebook um, as well as their website. They're doing a lot of really wonderful stuff. So that is the end of the kind of Karunkawa portion of um, my presentation. And so kind of moving on, transitioning is working and um, you know, being with Indigenous people, kind of the do's and don'ts. I'm never telling someone to change who they are. You were an individual. You can make your own decisions. This is just simply me bringing out the, you know, to be aware of what's being said, um, what's happening kind of in our world today. And so just being aware, honestly, is kind of the best thing to do. Um, there is a lot of sensitivities that's going on, as people have kind of seen with cultures and communities right now. Um, a lot of them are now gaining recognition. Their, their voices are finally being heard and they're kind of coming out of these past traumas. You know, a lot of this is still stemming from the 1960s and the 1970s. So some of the major stuff happened. So we're all still kind of coming out of that trauma phase. So it's important to kind of hear these voices and, you know, kind of take a step back and see that how some of our language has been changed kind of due to these insensitivities. So um, again, just kind of bringing awareness. Um, one of the big ones, and this is depending on the person, Native American, American Indian, or Indigenous. Um, they're both commonly used and they're both very interchangeable. Um, it very much depends on who you're talking to. Some per people prefer one to another. Um, American Indian is more popular. Um, we did use the term Native American for a long time. It's kind of fading out, um, but an, um, an elder from the Ojibwe tribe I used to work at when I used to turn Native American, he asked me why I use that term. I'm like, well, you are native to America. He's like, well, aren't, also aren't you? And that's true. I am a Native American. I am native to the United States. So it's kind of counterintuitive. So American Indian is becoming very, very popular now. Um, however, the word indigenous is actually a lot safer and kind of is kind of an easier umbrella word to use for people who were in Canada and Mexico and South America, obviously you never call someone in Mexico if they were a Native American. Um, but kind of stemming onto those different cultural groups, you have um, the groups up in Canada who often refer to themselves as the First Nation or the First Peoples, um, or they also go by Aboriginal, very similar to that in Australia. Um, the Arctic peoples are not Eskimos. That is a very white word. And so they prefer being called the Inuit, the Inupiat, or the Aleut. Um, people in South America often prefer the word um, indigenous as well. So again, it's all very interchangeable. It's all very kind of much on the person, um, though I would just say indigenous or American Indian is a lot safer to use nowadays. Um, words to stop using or do your best. Like I said, I would never ask you to change, but just to be aware. Um, some of the words that give me the cringies um, is spirit animal. Um, that's really kind of come into play over the last five or so years. Um, everyone's like, oh, wine is my spirit animal or my fat cat that's sitting on my couch right now. She's my spirit animal. 
that's that's a very common phrase nowadays. Um, many tribes and cultural groups across the United States, across the globe, all have um, connections to plants and animals, and a lot of those all contain a type of spirit with them and are very, very significant to um, their spiritual and religious beliefs. So that's a big one. I would love to stay stop using the word tribe, like bride tribe. I think we've all may have seen these buttons or shirts or ribbons on um, bridal parties as they're traversing for their bachelorette party. Um, the word tribe is sensitive in the fact that the groups that are called tribes, these indigenous groups, they fought their way and they bled and they spoke out their rights to become recognized as a formal group to be referred to as a tribe, to be officially a group of people. So just to be so nonchalant about the word is kind of insensitive and kind of rude. Um, so if you're going to call somebody a tribe or, you know, referring to your group of friends, just call them a group of friends. Um, the word squaw, which is kind of a dirty word, I you don't typically hear it so much. It's very more common in the 1950s textbooks, um, but you will see it occasionally. Um, more in this Southwest. Squaw is a very derogatory word towards women. It often is referring to their genitals, to their vagina. It also is a word referring to them as a slut or a whore. So it is a very inappropriate word. Um, very much of a white term that was kind of, you know, bestowed onto them, unfortunately. However, it is kind of um, an interesting word that's kind of bringing itself back. A lot of indigenous women are actually reclaiming um, the word squaw, which I think is really fascinating, but also a lot of women are fighting to have that word changed. Like I have the image of the squaw valley where they're trying to have the word squaw removed. So it's a really interesting word, very disgusting word, but it's being taken two different ways, which I think is really fascinating. Sports teams. I'm not asking you to stop being a fan of these sports teams. Again, I'm never asking you to change just to be aware um, there's a lot of sports teams that we have nowadays in the United States that all have names stemming from indigenous groups like the Kansas City Chiefs, the Cleveland Indians, the Atlanta Braves, the um, Illinois State um, Fighting Illini, where they have inappropriate um, or cartoonish depictions of indigenous peoples. Um, they often have individuals wearing um, spiritual regalia, like I have the two images there. Um, the one person who's dancing, that's the mascot for the um, Illinois State Fighting Illini, who is wearing a full regalia, men wearing headdresses and face paint and so on, just doing it for amusement. Um, it's all very inappropriate. You know, you wouldn't want someone dressing up as the Pope or a nun or something as a sports team and trying to be funny about it. You know, there's just sensitivities when it kind of comes to that kind of thing. Now, there are some sports teams that do work with indigenous groups like the Florida State Seminoles, for instance. They partner up with the, um, the Seminole tribe in Florida and they work a lot with the community and make donations and so on, which is fantastic. Um, groups in the Southwest, like Arizona State, I believe, um, uses native artists to um, draw up new images for their jerseys and sporting equipment and so on. So they're willing to work with the indigenous groups, which I think is really fantastic. So again, I'm not asking you to stop being a, a Chiefs fan or an Indians fan or whatever, but just kind of be aware that this is still going on. And there are a lot of groups that are refraining and changing their names from these kind of indigenous groups. Um, phrases and a cultural appropriation. Um, as I said, we're in a very kind of sensitive world, which is very fair. You know, we're coming from a land, a world full of trauma. Um, and there's things that we do, what we don't realize what we're doing. Um, like I've been called racist, um, or being culturally inappropriate, which, you know, destroyed me kind of body and soul, but I took that kind of step back and realized, okay, what I was doing could be seen as something else. Um, so again, it's just being aware is really all I'm asking kind of when it comes to this presentation. So one of some of the big things, you know, referring to someone as chief, um, that is a um, high status, that's someone who is elected nowadays um, to lead a group. Um, I had a boss that liked to be called chief and it made me very uncomfortable. So just, you know, kind of a word to maybe refrain from using. Um, phrases that we know, like holding down the fort, that was something that um, soldiers would say to one another, um, as they were protecting the fort from the savage Indians who were coming in to raid the area. 
Um, another phrase is on a war path, again, referring to um, the primitive savage ways of American Indians and their aggression um, towards white settlers is another phrase um, that kind of stems from these unfortunate um, past events and so on. Um, calling a meeting a powwow. A powwow is a really important spiritual gathering of communities um, where they honor their ancestors and they're dancing for prayers to be answered and for illness. Um, by calling a get together a powwow, that's not exactly what it is. So again, a word that you could refrain from using. Um, a big one that I'm not seeing as much today, but still a big issue is Halloween costumes. Um, you know, all the guys want to wear the, the headdress, all the women want to wear buckskin. Um, what the the woman in the the middle image there she's wearing regalia for it to dance at a powwow um it is not a costume it's not something that they put on for fun though i have heard it be called a costume um by an indigenous person because it's something that they put on rarely you know um for a kind of a fun event so um never refer to um, powwow clothing as costumes that's not what they are it's regalia um it's all very spiritual it is made up of items that's um has cultural significance like eagle feathers, um, beads that were handmade and so on. Um, so those are all just kind of things just kind of be conscious about. If you guys have any questions, um, please go ahead and put them in the chat. You guys were all really fantastic. Um, I hope you learned a little bit from my presentation. I apologize if I stumbled over some words, you know, presenting is always kind of hard and complicated. And as I said, I am not an expert, but I have a deep passion for preserving um, the Kronkwa history and culture um, with the second portion of my presentation. I would never ask anyone to change who they are, just to be aware of all the cultural sensitivities going around to kind of help make the world a better place. Okay, we do have some questions and some comments in chat. Uh, the first one is, uh, would you say that their diet was more diverse and nutritious than the narrow diet of the Europeans of the 1500s? It was more diverse. You do get um, agriculture part um, going on. So, you know, they, they are growing things like squash, uh, melons. You have um, communities in the Southwest that are growing things like corn. So there were, there was formal agriculture going on for some of these groups. Um, and because they did actually have a lot of trade, you know, they had access to bison. They had access to all the different seafood animals that were living in the Gulf. Um, so they had a very, very um, interchangeable diet kind of compared to what was going on in Europe. Um, Europe, like you didn't have potatoes and stuff then. You didn't have corn. You didn't have some of the other things that you'd be getting from the Americas until um, exploration, until, you know, the 15, 1600s. So, but again, they were also trading. So yeah, their diet was a little bit different. Like I said, the only kind of main thing about their diet is that it, how do I put this? Um, Nothing was really genetically modified just yet. Like they, like I said, they did do formal agriculture and they were still kind of able to pick and choose like this crop was more successful. So we'll plant from those seeds and so on, but they weren't deliberately um, kind of changing their diet much like the Europeans were, if that kind of makes sense. I apologize for kind of jumping around on that question. That's a good answer. Okay. Where were the Talon records found? Um, so they were found in a college university in Paris, I believe. Um, you can find the, um, the untranslated records. I think I actually literally Googled them. I can't remember the resource where I found them, but like I said, they're in the process of being translated. Um, it's not, you know, something that's desperately needed. So unfortunately it's taking their time. Um, but you can find um, the written records from the Talons on um, online. You also can have access to um, Cabeza de Vaca's um, written journals uh, and ethnographies about the Kronkwa as well, which is really fascinating. All righty. And somebody made the comment, and you did mention it too, that they've also heard the term First Peoples. Mm -hmm. Yep. It, it all really depends on who you talk to. Like I said, people up in Canada, First Peoples, First Nations. Um, is really big up there um, with the Anishinaabe. Um, that's that's where I'm, um, where I lived for many years was up there. So I'm used to First Nations and Indigenous. But yeah, it all just kind of depends on who you're talking to, what region of the United States or North America or South America, anywhere that you are. Um, 
So yeah, there's a lot of different terms, but the best kind of thing to do is just simply ask what, um, you know, if you have a good standing relationship, don't just go up to person and be like, what do you call yourself? You know, <laughs> um, get to know that person first and, you know, see what they prefer being called. Everyone has, you know, everyone prefers a different, a different name and so on. Um, but, you know, like I said, refer to them as indigenous. If you can refer to them by their tribe and so on. Thanks, Ali. Uh, the next couple of questions are along that line. Um, a comment from a Canadian in our audience who notes that uh, First Nations and Aboriginal is usually capitalized in Canada. And um, I've been to Brazil and they capitalize Indigenous there too. So they're they're using them as proper names. Yes. Um, and if I, did next... not, if I did not capitalize them in my presentation, I sincerely apologize. I thought I did, but I don't think I did. And I very much apologize for that. Uh, another question along that line, among which groups is the term American Indian popular? Um, in Minnesota, you get American Indians becoming more popular. Um, down here as well, I've heard a lot of American Indians. Um, in the Southwest, I do hear that Native Americans are a little bit more popular. Um, but it all just, it depends on the group, unfortunately. I, I wish I could tell you kind of what regions, but it all really just kind of depends on who you're talking to. Um, I know that's not the best answer, but it all really kind of just depends on the people. Thank you. And then uh, from the 100 or so words known from the Karankwa language, can it be determined which language group it belonged to, each word belonged to, I guess? Um, with my research, it doesn't, it, it doesn't say who it's from. It just, the woman who dictated that, um, a woman was interviewed back in the 1890s. Her family worked with a Karankwa family, but if she doesn't say, um, to my knowledge, she doesn't say, you know, who it's from, what family group, what region it was. Um, so I don't know, unfortunately, where that language group comes from, unfortunately. But you can find the document actually online. You can get some of the written words um, with actually her handwriting, which is really cool. So you can see some of the um, the documentation. You can find that online. Thanks, Chris. Okay, yeah. So the next the next few are, are, are kind of comments. Somebody said there's a there's a sports team in Jordanton, and I guess it's in Texas, where squaw is the name of their of their female sports team still. And then somebody else mentioned another word not to use is powwow. And this was before you talked about powwow. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the Cleveland, someone mentioned the Cleveland Indians are now the Cleveland Guardians in re in response to. Oh, that's uh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and um, I think, oh, uh, somebody uh, went to a college. The team name is Alini. Considering the state is Illinois getting rid of the name wouldn't work. However, the bogus Indian chief was eliminate the name Alinawick was eliminated a few years ago. Yep. Yeah. Their mascot, I think, officially ended in 2006 is when they kind of changed it. Um, so it's it's a lot more sensitive now and um much more aware. So yeah, that's one of the changes that they did. And I know like the Washington Redskins. It's no longer around, but I think they were willing to change. Um, so the American Indian movement in the 1970s, they actively went against sports teams. And so that's where you get a lot of the big changes for um, sports teams. But there are some, like I said, um, Illinois State, I can understand. But again, it's just it's how you present it. Um, the way they had their mascot, literally a white person dancing around in a full, you know, regalia with a full headpiece and everything else. But again, that was, it was a different time. We're much more aware now, much more sensitive. Um, so it's a, it's a positive change. It certainly is. Uh, how did you first get interested in the Karankawa? So um, I actually used to work at the George Ranch Historical Park here in Richmond, Texas. Um, and one of our big um, wants for school programs was about indigenous culture and coming from Minnesota, you know, where we have, you know, about 10 or so reservations. I grew up and I worked on one for many years. Um, when I moved on to Texas, I was just kind of dumbfounded that there were just no native tribes around. Uh, we do have three registered tribes in Texas. The closest one is the Alabama Cushada. That's like two hours away, but the other ones are like 
12 hours away. Texas is a huge state. <laughs> so um, with my background working with indigenous cultures up in Minnesota, um, my supervisor asked me if I was willing to make a presentation, um, a school group. And I kind of just, you know, learned about the Kronkman and I thought they were really fascinating. Um, and it's just kind of been my passion from that, especially discovering that the tribe is trying to come back, that they're trying to relearn this language. So I think that's really fantastic what they're doing. And that's kind of why I'm here. I would love to keep preserving the knowledge and everything about them and changing the myths that we know about them. And, you know, so that's kind of my inspiration for learning more about the Karunkla people. The next question, how have you used the digs from the Houston Archaeological Society? Um, so I personally haven't done any of the, um, I haven't done any archaeological digs. Archaeology is kind of not my specialty. Um, but there is a lot of forensic work that is being done. Um, oh, shoot, what school is it? I think it is Texas A&M who does have the remains of the individual that I mentioned earlier. Um, so they're doing some research on her, um, doing facial reconstructions and so on to learn more about her because they actually found her in a construction site. Um, but a lot of the archaeological discoveries that they have, you can find in museums all across Texas or um, by private collectors as well. Um, there is not a whole lot just because, like I said, there are so many other cultures going on. And plus, we live in an area where there's constant hurricanes and everything else. So we don't have a lot of records about them just because some of those things were destroyed by natural disasters and so on. Um, yeah, that answers your question. Thanks. Lots and lots of thank yous. Uh, yeah, we've learned a lot today. Um, how do you respond to people that uh, say the Karankwa are extinct? Um, I'm sorry, do you mean, was, could you reread that question one more time? I yeah, apologize. the question is, how do you respond to people that say the Karankwa are extinct? Um, you know, I mean, what was the Karankwa? Yes, the Karankwa are extinct. Um, the Karankwa Kadla, which is the descendants, is not. Um, there are parts of the culture with the Karankwa, unfortunately, that we're never going to be able to recover, which is awful. And that's why I kind of use the word extinct, because it was officially lost for, you know, over 100 years. There's a lot of things that just we're never going to get back. Um, so I don't really want to use the word extinct, though I did just say they are. Um, but the Karankwa Kadla really is a different group because they are taking um, the descendants who are in this group. Some of them are mixed with Apache. Some of them are mixed with Pueblo and so on. So no one's a direct distinct connection to the Karankwa people. They are kind of a mixed descendant. So <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, I would say, yeah, the Karankwa is extinct, um, I guess, going from kind of a historical archaeological record. And Chris, I'll do one more, and then I'll pass it off to you. This is an interesting, what about referring to a flower, uh, a flower's non-scientific name like Indian blanket? Can that be offensive? Um, is there, I mean, it's also called fire wheel. Would that be preferable? I mean... <laughs> It's if you know if you know a better word, you know definitely use it. Um, the purple plant, which name I don't remember, but there's one. It's it's found abundance in Texas. Um, it, as known as the creeping and wandering Jew, I think it's now called the purple heart. If you know the proper term for it, I would say I would prefer that. I mean, unless you can whip out the scientific name, that's fantastic. Um, but I mean, like I said, I would never ask you to change. Just be aware if you are comfortable and used to calling in an, um, an Indian blanket. I mean, that is your own personal preference. I would say if you knew the correct term or if you wanted to call it by a different name, I would say that's probably the safest choice. Um, like I said, it's better to just be safe than sorry. Um, and I know all of you guys are master naturalists. So you guys know all the plant names, so I'm not so much worried about you guys. Um, but thank you guys all. And again, if there's more questions, I'm more than willing to answer. Um, but uh, Muhammad does have my email address and he is more than welcome to share it. So if anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, anything that you think I can improve on or anything with my presentation, please feel free to reach out. I'm available anytime. So um, thank you guys again so much. Again, I'm still willing to answer questions if anyone has any more. We still have some more. 
if you're willing not, to stay on. Okay, Chris, not, take it yes, from here. We have some more. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm scrolling through to pick out. There's a lot of comments too. Um, oh, okay. Uh, somebody's uh, comment, if, if only 100 words from the original language were retained, how are the Karankawa reestablishing the language? So, like I said, they, they're they relearning that vocabulary that was preserved through their written document. So they do have access to that. But um, as I mentioned, there are a couple words that they learned from their, you know, from their relatives of their ancestors who were able to surpass the boarding schools and retain some of that knowledge. So it's, it's a language that is constantly being changed, just kind of being updated. Um, as they discover um, more documents, you I mean things are coming up in the archaeological record new every day. Um, so more things are being discovered. Um, more people are, you know, recognizing that they are Karankwa and there are things of their past that they remember. So they're taking kind of bits and pieces from different written records, oral histories, and so on that they can gather. And they're kind of forming a language that way. I don't know if it'll ever be a complete spoken dialect, kind of what, what we have today. Um, but I know they're doing their darndest to try to get a, a full vocabulary. So it's all kind of from written record and from oral histories that they are kind of able to um, collect a vocabulary for the language. Okay, this is a good question. How did the indigenous people feel about the land acknowledgement? Um, land acknowledgement as in... Um, uh, we, a lot of presentations uh, start out with the the land acknowledgement. Yes. Um, How, how's that felt, you know? I mean, it's, like I said, it's great just kind of being aware. I mean, if I was in person with you guys, I would probably ask just kind of for a moment to start out with, which I typically do, especially with my young ones that I give presentations in school programs. So I'm like, just kind of think about where you are. I'm like, this once did belong to somebody else. Um, so just kind of bringing that recognition. Um, I kind of wish I had done it more in the beginning, but it's kind of hard with Zoom. So I'm not just staring at you quietly for a moment. Um, but, you know, just kind of being aware of where you are, um, the land that you're on used to belong to somebody else. And there is so much history beneath our feet. Um, so um, like I said, just being aware is really good. I do kind of wish I did that in the beginning of my presentation. I normally do. So I apologize for not doing that. Um, but you know, there's there's so much more that was before us, and it's always great just to kind of be aware of what was once here before. So there, so that's a good. That's not a bad thing to do then. So that's not yeah. something. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, somebody asked if any of that the Karankawa groups were invited to the presentation. Um, to my knowledge, I am not aware. Um, I am in contact with a gentleman by the name of Tim Sider. He is kind of the liaison um, for the Kwankwa people down in Corpus Christi. Um, he is kind of aware of all the things that I've been doing. Um, he does a lot of presentations about them as well, um, but not, this isn't really a kind of a popular topic that a lot of people, um, you know, kind of talk about and so on as in it's history. No one really wants to talk about it. Um, so kind of between him and I, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn when I say this, I don't really know. Oh, excuse me, um, anyone else that does these kind of presentations about the Karankawa? Um, just because, I mean, there is a little bit known about them, but, you know, new things are being learned every day. Um, so to my knowledge, I don't know if we have any Karankawa descendants here, if any were invited to the presentation. Um, I know I'm diligently working on creating a relationship with them um, through my work. Um, so they're out there for sure. Um, but I don't know, unfortunately, if anyone was invited to the presentation or not. Okay. I'm going to do one more. Are there any history books that you would recommend? Um, so Tim Sider, as I mentioned, he, um, he is actually writing his PhD all about the Krunkwa. Um, and you can find his website online. It's Tim Sider. So S E I T E R. Um, he's writing like a hunt, like an 800 page, um, textbook. Um, all about the Karankawa and the Karankawa um, Spanish War in 1779. Um, so he's got a lot of great stuff on his website. Um, I haven't found any successful textbooks. Um, the Texas Historical Commission, um, they do have an online page that is about the Karankawa and theirs is pretty good. They have a lot of great resources. Um, oh, please repeat the author's name. His name is Tim Seiter, S-E-I-T-E-R. You can find his website online. 
Um, and he actively works with the Karankawa um, Kabla down in Corpus Christi. He's kind of the liaison. Um, so he's writing a fantastic book, but I don't know of any textbooks around that um, really kind of talk about the Karankawa. And if they do, you know, it still has those myths that I talked about before. And um, with school children, they get the Native Americans in fourth grade, and that's the only time, to my knowledge, is that they get introduced to Native Americans in Texas. So any of the textbooks that you find are going to be for elementary school children. Um, but yeah, that's probably one of the best books um, that I know of that he is writing and is working on. And he does have a list of more resources on his webpage as well. He's kind of the expert. Um, so I would definitely check out his page. He's got lots of great stuff. Allie. I am going to, um, I've scrolled all the way back almost to the beginning of the messages. You received a message from uh, one of the audience members named Jody, and I think she may have written it in Karankwa. I'm not really sure. And um, Chris and I were trying to figure out how we could read this because we can't pronounce it. But um, I, this is just an answer to if there were any Karankwa that were invited. So I don't know if Jody is still here or not. Um, it's C-H-O-K-M-A, Allison. Is that in Karankwa? She says it's Chickasha. Chickasha, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't, I unfortunately, I don't know a lot of the Karankwa language. It's something that I would love to learn, um, but I don't know much more about, I don't know a lot of the words um, of the language, um, but I appreciate, um, in any language that's spoken, I really appreciate that. That's really cool. Thank you, Jody. I so now I'm going back down. I don't know if there, Chris, are there any more questions? No, I was looking at my Mike. Um, he he said we, we're that we we we're the recent Kwakwa people identified through DNA. I guess he's asking the question how they identify if they identified. Is that is. Um, I don't believe it's through DNA, just because we don't really, to my knowledge. I don't know if there's any DNA records. Like I said, they did have the the the, the skeleton that was found a couple of years ago, um, and they're linking it to Krunkula, but I don't officially know if that's the case or not. Um, I don't know any of the more recent findings. I haven't heard anything recently. Um, so to my knowledge, it's not DNA. It's all through, um, through oral studies and um, stories that have been passed on from their family. Um, that they learned from their grandparents or someone that, hey, we were Karunko at one point. Um, so to my knowledge, no, it's not DNA. It's more oral traditions. Okay. And and here's what somebody's just asking, how can we learn more? <laughs> <laughs> how can we learn more? Um, so like I said, the Texas Historical Commission, they have a really great website um, that talks about the Karunkwa as well as other indigenous tribes of Texas. And they have a fantastic amount of resources um, Tim Sider also has great resources on his website. Um, the Karankwa Kabla have their own page as well that also has other great resources um, and kind of more from their perspective, which is extremely helpful. Um, so definitely check out those three that I mentioned, um, Tim Sider's page, the Texas Historical Commissions, and then um, the Karankwa Kabla page as well. Um, that all has great resources if you want to learn more about the tribe itself. Yes, karankwas.com, that's it. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Allie. Yeah, thank you guys again so much. This is a lot of fun. And again, if you um, would like my email, Muhammad does have it. Um, I guess I can post it as well in the chat um, as long as it doesn't get lost. Uh, but please feel free to email me um, at any point if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns. Um, oops, I just direct messaged that to you. Well, that's okay. Um, but if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, anything, um, please let me know. But thank you guys so much for letting me come on tonight and for doing the presentation. And I really greatly appreciate everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. This was, this was a really informative and very useful presentation. And, and looking at the comment, people really liked, uh, and I think they want to learn more. I'm so thank glad. <laughs> It was terrific. Thank you very much, Allison. It was it was really wonderful. We really appreciate it.